Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our this dialogue, a documentary by the name of Tzuzuta, unveiling Ethiopia's musical legacy was premiered at the 18th Addis International Film Festival. And Aramazd Kalajian is the producer and director of Tzuzuta, unveiling the captivating journey into the very heart of Ethiopian big band musical orchestra. And I've caught up with him at the Sharat and Addis to talk about Tzuzuta and others along the line. With the program, I'm Shifar Alak. Do stay with us. Thank you so much for making the time to talk to us. Thank you for having me. Now, Tzita traces back to the origins of modern jazz in Ethiopia. As you know, Emperor Haile Selassie brought back 40 Jerusalem orphans that were descendants of Armenian uh, genocide. And this paved the way to the introduction of the first imperial band, which was also uh, instrumental and the source and backdrop, if you will, of the national anthem of Ethiopia and also the popularization of orchestral band in Ethiopia. Could you briefly uh, walk us through the musical journey of Ethiopia as depicted by the documentary? Sure. So uh, uh, think about the year 1924. Uh, from a European perspective, the League of Nations is being formed. Yes. Uh, and from an Ethiopian perspective, uh, Ethiopia is the candidate to be the first African nation in the League of Nations, which is the predecessor of the United Nations. Yes. So as it is, at that time, Rastafari, uh, before he became Haile Selassie, the emperor, um, he went on a journey to Europe to thank all the nations that supported Ethiopia's uh, membership into uh, the League of Nations. Before going to Europe, though, because, you know, uh, Rastafari and Haile Selassie later on, was he was a religious man, yeah. and he thought, if I'm going to Europe, before I go to Europe, let me go to Jerusalem, where the Orthodox Christianity has its uh, kind of center in Jerusalem. And there he found, again in 1924 is the context, Armenian, 40 Armenian children who had lost their mothers and fathers to the Armenian genocide that occurred in the Ottoman Empire by uh, the Turkish government in the mid-1915. So imagine uh, you're a child, maybe eight or seven years old at the time of the genocide, and you come to the church, and the church is taking care of you. They give you instruments and teach you how to play music. And at this time where uh, Haile Selassie is coming to visit, or Rastafari is coming to visit the church, these children have already practiced and learned music, and they play for his honor. Wow. So he, he sees these children, he, he thinks of their story, and he, he also thinks of what he's about to do, you know. Uh, part of uh, Haile Selassie's uh, uh, grandeur as a leader was that he knew how to be a diplomat and so he knew that also not just these children needed homes and jobs but he also knew that it would be good for him to show that what type of person he is in terms of dignity and nobility before he goes to europe yeah. and so these children became the first royal band of ethiopia they popularized uh, western instruments they used to exist in uh, ethiopia uh, on both i mean uh, in, in some places but uh, he, uh, the, everywhere that Emperor Haile Selassie went, these children played. Wow. And so it, it showed Western instruments every, every step that the emperor took. And they learned all the uh, national anthems of all the other countries. Mm -hmm. And at some point, uh, Haile Selassie realized that the Ethiopia needed its own uh, uh, national anthem, of yeah. course. And the person that was the uh, band leader of these 40 orphans in Amharic, it's Amharinya, it's Arbali Joch. Uh, the 40 orphans uh, band leader, Kevork Nabanyan, composed the music. Uh, and there was an Ethiopian uh, man who wrote the Gitmoch, the lyrics, mm. and uh, a poet, actually. Uh, it became the national anthem for almost 50 years, you know. Uh, wow. Ethiopia Hoy is the name of the song. 
So yeah, the that 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 wasn't the beginning of uh, the Armenians' connection with Ethiopia, but it was one of the more significant parts of the shared story mm -hmm. that Armenians and Ethiopians had. Right. I, I, you know, the the Arbali Joch, the forty children, were not the introduction of music. There was already a culture of uh, the the bard culture, the minstrel culture, the uh, you know. This in our in our film, Alamaya Shete talks about how it was basically like a, a, a poet would have one instrument, and it would either be the karar or the masinko. So uh, the music was there, but when the orchestra of the forty orphans came, what it showed was uh, the or the introduction of uh, orchestral playing, and then the band leader Kevork Nalbandian started to train Ethiopian uh, musicians yes. to start playing the, the, the you know, trombone, trumpet, uh, yeah, the instruments for, for bands. So it kind of started to massage into the culture this combination of traditional music plus the Western instruments, which is kind of the recipe for modern music. I, I have to give credit to Francis Falsetto in our movie, he basically says, like, the recipe for modern music is traditional music mm. plus Western instruments. This documentary goes beyond going deeper than that, exploring the musical revolution in Ethiopia that swept before the Derg regime. So could you also give us a synopsis of uh, what it was all about? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know if you've ever read, there's a book called, uh, by Gabriel Garcia Marquez called 100 Years of Solitude. It's like, it's a story of like three generations of uh, how one action affected three generations later. So in, in this, in our film, it's kind of like that. Uh, it has almost like three generations of stories from we explore the Menelik time, we explore Haile Selassie time, the Dirk time, and then kind of now as well. Yeah. But not the governments, more so what, what the life is like here, what the people's memories are of the city, of music, of their teachers and loved ones. I mean, we explore the concept of Tezeta. Tezeta as like uh, memories, as like your nostalgia, nostalgia like uh, the feeling of wanting something that is not really here now, but that you always will remember, you know? Yes. So th that's kind of what we, the good and the bad, you know? Yes. Tazata can be good and Tazata can also be yes. not so good. So, yes. so we, that's kind of what we explored. And because we decided the movie to be almost exclusively in Addis Ababa, it kind of, it, it, it naturally revolved around uh, the Taitsu Hotel, Jazamba, and the musicians that used to play over there. And what was the reaction like from the audience? How did Tzita open the door to memories, you know, flooding back and bringing to mind this recollection of a uh, um, golden musical era, perhaps long forgotten? Something that's special uh, about our film and the experience of you know when you start something yeah. and you know that in this moment that you are in, it's like, it's like your, one, your only chance. And when you're in our, your only chance, you know that maybe tomorrow or the next day, it might not be there. That you might not have it. And that in this moment that you are in, yeah. it's the most important thing that you have, you know, wow. being, being here. So when we were interviewing like Alamaya Shete, uh, when we were interviewing Gitacho de Balke, Abate Mokuria, when we were interviewing, uh, you know, uh, many of the, the musicians that played there, you always felt like maybe the band might not be there next year, you know, maybe the person might not be there next year. I mean, I didn't know that I was who I was talking to when I interviewed Francis Falsetto. I mean, imagine Francis Falsetto and Amha Achete sitting in the car and they're talking like old friends, kind of poking fun at each other, you know? And you see this, like, it's a really beautiful, genuine moment, but I didn't know while I was filming that that would be, like, he, I wouldn't be, have a chance to do that again because Amha Achete passed away. Yeah. So many people uh, are not with us, you know? Uh, and 
in Armenian they say uh, which means uh, may God illuminate their souls you know and in a way with our film with what we do with Tazita is you bring their memory into you so you give light to the souls I'm, I'm going to be very honest I, I was surprised by how much the uh, people who watched the film really loved it I mean like I didn't expect, um, I mean, we, th we thought of things when me and my co-director, Garekin Papoyan, when we were editing, uh, we were thinking about always putting the Ethiopian person's voice first mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's from the perspective of someone who was born and raised here that shares their story and you then feel it. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it can't be like only, you know, specialists or researchers that, that, that aren't really connected to the culture or to the history. So part of that, I think, carried the story through, mm -hmm. especially when, you know, you're born and raised in Ethiopia. You know Getacho Mokuria. You know Alamayo Eshete. And when you see them on the screen smiling and meeting each other and like l showing genuine love and friendship and then like them looking at the city and uh, the changes and just remembering the past you feel that connection with them it's it feels real it's uh, the director and producer of Tzuzita how do you rate the success of this documentary I mean for me it's unexpected success because the amount of people that took so much interest they want to show the film again. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we are going to be showing the film again at the National Theater on June 1st at 6 p.m. And we are hoping to have a, a, a real big turnout with many of the musicians who are still alive to come and uh, be part of the audience. We'll have a small uh, panel discussion with a, a Q&A. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're hoping, we're, I, I, I didn't expect to show the film a second time or th or a third time. I only thought that it would be this one time and people loved it so much that they were like, we have to show this film again. So it was really amazing. I'm, I'm very, very grateful and thankful. Yeah. I'm kind of humbled, man. It's, it's a little weird. Wow. I didn't realize that it would be like this. And it's, it took like 10 years to make, uh, partially just because, you know, if you think about the concept of Tazata, you can't have a film about nostalgia without time yes. being a part of it. Yes. So it took us literally 10 years to actually complete the film so that the idea, the feeling of Tizata is in the movie itself. As you know, beyond uh, the music, the friendship between Ethiopia and Armenia uh, spans other areas, be it culture or diplomacy, things like that. So how would you describe the relationship between Ethiopia and Armenia as we speak? It's something really unique, man, I got to tell you, because um, every Armenian that I've known who has come across uh, Ethiopian culture feels a deep connection to this land, to the culture. Um, we have very sim we have some similar roles. I mean, uh, there, you know, we were one of the first uh, Orthodox Christian nations. And from that time, we had many relations with each other uh, in ter within that context of religion. Um, in a time when Armenians did not have a country in like the late 1800s, mm. they were just, um, they were a large population inside the Ottoman Empire. And we, because we had this religious connection, the emperors of Ethiopia trusted Armenians because we would not pose a colonial risk and we provided the possibility to have access to weaponry, technology. I mean, think about uh, like guns, importing guns to okay. fight against the Italians during Amenelik's time. Or like, uh, you know, the first, uh, oh, you know, the, the, the area called Sabara Babur? Yes. And there's an Armenian man whose name was Sarkis Tezian who went to Djibouti and drove this road-making machine steamroller all the way to Addis Ababa where the machine broke down. And so that, that area still today is called Sabara Babur. I mean, this, for me, when you hear these stories, 
and you realize that there's this like beautiful connection between us as Armenians, as people, we were serving the emperors. You know, we, the Armenians were uh, like working for Menelik, for Haile Selassie, and literally like they're like workers. Sometimes even the secret police, sometimes even like uh, members of the military, uh, people who were the photographers royally, from the arts to, you know, they were part of the Ethiopian society, even though they were like very, but there weren't that many in numbers. Yes. They were just integrated into the society. So um, I think that it has a lot to do with uh, the trust that is uh, built between Ethiopians and Armenians because we share a religious foundation with one another and that Armenians genuinely wanted to serve the, and the emperors and the nation. And how will the documentary beef up the friendship, cordial ties between Ethiopia and Armenia? You know, revitalizing the relationship between the two countries. Well, I think, I think what it does is shows what's already there. And in a way that you, you know, especially for Ethiopian audience and for an Armenian audience, because it's our two culture stories, yes. people want to watch it. Um, so when you see something you want to watch and you see the friendship that exists between the two cultures, you kind of get this sense for uh, what is possible now. Yeah. And what are the ways forward? I mean, how should the two countries work together? so that they will have a better relationship, better and mutual uh, cooperation in the future. The way for Armenia and our Ethiopians to move forward is a mutual respecting of the past. Like in Armenia, just like now, they're starting to realize that maybe we should preserve some of the old buildings and even cinema houses. Um, some of the old films mm. that are still in the archives that are not digitized or cleaned. Um, and I think that we can collaborate in a really high level uh, with regards to preserving each of our own cultures, but together with different technologies and different programs and different um, mm. uh, initiatives. I think it's important. Thank you so much for the time and the ideas that you've given me. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, dear viewers, with that, we come to the end of today's program. Thank you so much for having been with us so far. And till I see you next time with yet another program, it's a bye-bye from me, Shifar Alak.